Hi, everybody. Uh, we're just starting to let people into the room. So just getting things started. Hope you're all having a, a good day. And if you could let me know, um, if somebody in the chat could let me know that you can hear me and, and see me okay, that would be great. Um, just so I know that all of that is working fine. Um, but yeah, so we are starting in uh, literally four minutes, properly speaking. So don't worry, we, we are not getting started just yet. So it's still going to be a, a few moments. Hi, Diane, Julia, and Michelle. Thank you so much for letting me know that all is good. Hi, Peter, how are you doing? And everybody else joining into the, the talk today, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Chat is going to be open now for the next uh, three and a half minutes. So very, very glad to hear that you're here, where you're coming from, how is art history going for you, or uh, any questions that you may have, uh, you're welcome to fire away. Buenas noches, Eva, ¿qué tal estás? Hi, Elizabeth, thank you so much for being back. Hope you're having a nice time. And well, I hope you're all doing very good. I am making sure I'm hydrated because it's been 30 degrees today in Malta, which has been quite warm. So, ah, Memphis, Memphis and I are, are on the warm side then. Hi, Michelle. How are you doing over here? It's, it's been weird. On one side of the island, it was much hotter than the other. It was much nicer when I got to Valletta in the... Um, in the sort of later afternoon, because it, it was a bit cooler than on on the other side. But there you go. Katya, um, everyone else seems to be able to hear me. So if if so, try to come in out of the meeting. Uh, welcome, welcome guys. Welcome Arizona. Hi from Oregon. How are you doing? Oh, Mark, if the image is not so good, um, I'm, I'll try to reset my camera just in case, but everything seems fine. Again, try coming in and out of the meeting because Zoom has been having a couple of problems, but I will reset the image and, and see if that just helps everybody. So I'll, I'll do that just now. Okay, so that's... That's uh, as much as we can do on, on that front. I hope that helps. Welcome. How are you doing, Steamery? Welcome, Denise. Hi, Yoti. Thank you so much for joining us from Auckland. Hi, from Ireland, Sheila. I hope you're doing well. Hola, buenas tardes. Bueno, <laughs> buenas tardes o buenos días, Jennifer, desde Costa Rica. Hello from Hawaii. How are you doing there? Welcome, Maggie. How are you? Hi, Carol. Welcome, Ashrith. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Oh, no worries, Asrith, you can join the recording. Yes, um, for anybody that has missed um, the previous week on, on Art History Masters of the Renaissance or on the last episode of the Vikings that we just had on Saturday, you still have it available for, for a week. So, you know, make sure that you catch on. Um, that will be available for you on the World Virtual Tours website. Hi, Linda. How are you doing? Buonasera la Firenze. Grazie. How are you doing, Barbara? No worries. My pleasure. Oh, wow. Amazing, Julie. Thank you so much for being here. Julie and Julia, who is much chilly in the UK for sure. Hi from Toronto. How are you doing? Thank you so much. Um, and there you go. Well, excellent. Um, we are almost about to start, guys. So let me just have a little bit of water. And we will get started. Oh, as um, I would love to hear about where you're going on, on holiday very soon. But anyway, so um, we need to get rolling, guys. And we actually have a lot to cover today in this um, in this particular session. But I promise that before we started the session properly, I would um, have a few moments to clarify any questions that you may have from uh, Michelangelo and Leonardo before we get started. However, a very brief introduction first. So um, in the chat, you now have the links for all of the upcoming tours and also for the donations that keep on funding the project of World Virtual Tours. You know, everything we do here is just funded through the generosity of your donations via PayPal and Stripe, and you have the link in there now. And in case that you don't know me, let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Lilian Cespedes-Gonzalez. I am a historian. Uh, that's 
the, where the PhD comes from. I have a PhD in history from the University of Winchester. And well, art is kind of my thing in, in, many, in many ways, more than just the traditional sense. And we are on episode three out of four of the great masters of the Renaissance. So if you've missed last week, like I said, on Michelangelo, um, you still can catch up on World Virtual Tours um, and the Free Academy. Uh, this week, we're focusing on Raphael. And then next week, we're doing a contextualization lecture, meaning that we've spoken about uh, Leonardo, Raphael, and Michelangelo, but we're going to, um, you know, bring it all together by talking about the world of the Renaissance overall, specifically from the point of view of art. Now, before we get started with Raphael, guys, I said that I would be open to a few questions. So any questions that you would like me to clarify from Leonardo or Michelangelo, this is your moment now. Um, obviously, you also have time at the end of the tour, but anything specific about the previous two lectures, please go ahead. Or any further thoughts that you've had about, you know, the paintings that we've seen or things that you would like to discuss. At the end of the day, is, this is supposed to be a classroom, so um, let me know your thoughts. Cindy, is there a way to see the ones we missed? Yes, uh, they are in, in, in World Virtual Tours in the Free Academy site for the course. Um, you have there, not just for this, but any of the talks you may have missed. However, do keep in mind that they are um, only temporary. They are not going to be open um, for much longer than the, the duration of the course itself. And some of the, perhaps the first one may have expired as well. And yes, they are in, in YouTube as well, because we are uh, transmitting over to YouTube. So if you're watching us at home from YouTube, hello to you. Michelangelo, which uh, one painting did he create? Well, we have uh, several, Jennifer. In uh, the lecture last week of Michelangelo, we covered several pieces of sculpture, which were the Battle of the Centaurs, La Pietà, the David, of course, and Moses. And then we uh, covered, in terms of paintings, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and um, the Last Judgment. If I remember correctly, those were the, the main things that we covered from the point of view of, of painting itself. And the last bit that we covered about Michelangelo was the uh, work that he did as an architect in the um, St. Peter's Basilica for the Dome. Uh, but in terms of paintings, we covered uh, very, very specific ones just to highlight several aspects of his career that were, as to say, crucial, and the development of mannerism. Now, I'm bringing up mannerism because we're going to hear that word a lot in, uh, in today's talk for Raphael. So I'm just reminding you of a few, few key concepts. But don't worry, these key concepts we will be rediscovering again next week because part of the contextualization lecture is to, you know, put all the, all, crossing all the T's and, and dots in the I's for things like sfumato, uh, contrapposto, you know, all of these terms that potentially may be a bit um, unheard of or unfamiliar and uh, just to, to nail them down. No worries, Jennifer, my pleasure. Excited in week, yes, excellent, Julia. Wow, that sounds amazing. Excellent. Well, um, if you guys don't have any more questions, please just um, let me know. But, you know, um, yes, no, the, the, the recaps are not forever. So, yes, Maria is absolutely right. They are not forever. They've been they've been um, sort of put on a temporary basis. So if you if you are missing one or two, though, do make sure that you contact World Virtual Tours because they may be able to allow temporary access for a little bit shorter. Um, but yes, keep in mind that they are on a very, very short basis. And we are only doing them for the free academy talks. So they are not available for the other talks that we have. So for example, the virtual tour of Malta that you're doing with me this Sunday will only be available live. We will not be doing it as a replay. We will be doing other tours through World Virtual Tours about Malta from home, but this one will not be on, on demand on that sense. Okay, well, um, let's, uh, I, now that I've clarified some questions, I'm going to close the chat while we're doing the general um, lecture itself. Okay, so we will be opening that uh, shortly later on, but uh, let's get started and start focusing a bit more on uh, Raphael specifically, which is what we're talking about today. So let me start sharing screen and uh, let's 
let's get rolling because, well, we have, <laughs> I think I may have gotten a bit too ambitious with this one. <laughs> I decided to do Raphael in 12 works, in 12 pieces of art, which, you know, I appreciate this quite a lot, but at the same time, it's going to go a lot faster than you will realize. Now, as always, and as usual, we're going to start with an introduction to the artist himself. So this is Raphael. He's a young man from Urbino, and he's born in 1483. He's the son of Giovanni Santi, who um, coincidentally is also a painter and a poet at court. So as you can see, in comparison to, for example, Leonardo or Michelangelo, Raphael's background is going to be a little bit different. He has a little bit of a head start because what he's going to do with his life already run in the family. Well, he's going to start his education in the workshop of Perugino in 1495. And I'm sure if, if you've been keeping track of timing, you will realize that by this moment in time, our two previous artists, both Leonardo and Michelangelo, were already working as artists or finishing their um their education. So there is a big gap between them all, and that's going to work actually in Raphael's favor in some ways. Now, Raphael is going to have a first uh, period of, of resurgence between 1504 and 08. This is what we call the Florentine period, and this is the moment where he's going to be literally soaking in all the works that you've already seen and learned about from Leonardo and Michelangelo, and use them for his own benefit, because in the same way the other masters were referencing, you know, other pieces of art, Raphael is going to do it, but from the very best. And that's what's going to give him a little bit of a head start, maybe, or a better insight into how to develop his career better. Well, he's going to go through different periods and, and different things that he's going to do in life. But in 1508, he actually goes to Rome to start working there in a few commissions. And one of those important uh, works that he's going to do is in 1517, when he becomes the superintendent of antiquities named by Pope Leo X. So as you can see, it wasn't just the fact he was working as an artist, he was also doing some curation, which is important in his career as an artist, because that's going to allow him to inform himself a little better. And then, very unfortunately for us, he dies at the age of 37 in 1520, which means his career is cut very short. And yet in that small period of time, he produces so many masterpieces that, well, it's it's what makes his, his life and his career as an artist remarkable. And by the way, in case that you're interested, his tomb is actually in the Pantheon. Well, what is the important thing about Raphael to keep in mind as we look through these paintings? Raphael becomes the master of the two things that Leonardo and Michelangelo had already mastered. Color blending from Leonardo plus the composition and pyramidal structure from Michelangelo is what's going to propel this artist to a new level. So he gets a lot of criticism because perhaps he's not as inspirational or maybe as innovative as the other two. But, you know, sometimes being good at your job just requires you to, you know, being good at your job. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. And yet you're going to see that Despite those criticisms, there are some innovations in Raphael that will actually take him to the level of a grandmaster in such a short period of time. Well, let's start talking about the thing that will actually make him famous and sustain him for the vast majority of his lifetime, which is the Madonnas. Now, Raphael is going to make a total of 18 Madonnas, 17 including 17 plus this one, the Madonna and the child with the book. And that's literally going to be his proverbial bread and butter. He's going to make a living from this for quite some time, I must say. And today we're going to be seeing three of his different Madonnas. So we're starting with this one. This um, is an oil on panel and a lot of the work we're going to be seeing from Raphael is, is oil from that perspective. And what you see here is a typical scene of the Madonna sitting down with the baby on her lap. You notice how the blue mantle that is surrounding her figure kind of helps frame the actual um, imagery and, and set the scene for us. But um, we see that he's very, very fresh as an artist in here. Um, this is right before he moves to, to Florence properly. So it's, it's still baby steps. And you're going to see very clearly 
how he moves on from this to the next level with the next painting. Now, the reason why Raphael will produce so many Madonnas, like many other artists of the Renaissance, is because um, these were used often in people's homes as um, for small chapels and things like that, as well as for bigger commissions for, you know, uh, churches, um, monasteries, convents, etc., etc. So they were essentially a, an item that was in high demand at the time, and that's why we see so many. It's not because he just decided, oh, I'm just going to paint Madonnas. No, remember, all of these are commissions, and therefore the artists are very much at the subject of, of their patrons. But we're going to see a few pieces of Raphael today that uh, seem to have followed different routes for their commission, at least. Well, from one Madonna to another, here is the Madonna of the Pinks. And if you remember from the first week with Leonardo, there is a Madonna that inspired this. And you have it there once again, which is the Benoit Madonna. Now, if you remember, it's a very similar painting. And in fact, one of the reasons why um, this Madonna was uh, actually perceived to be or, or believed by many to be a a fake or a copy for a long time is because the color palette is not very classical Raphael because he is pretty much borrowing and imitating from Leonardo. Now, the composition of the painting overall is very much the same. The main thing in which this differs from the Benoit Madonna of Leonardo is in the, in the flowers. These are carnations. It's not a sprig. Um, like in the case of the Benoit Madonna, these are carnations. And why carnations? Many people um, ask me this and because they don't necessarily know the link between specific plants and religious theology. But carnations, like many other things that we've seen in art history, have this um, kind of symbolic use in Christian liturgy, which essentially um, relates to the Passion of Christ. So again, this is one of those visionary paintings that is alluding to what's coming in the life of Jesus, yet while sharing this very tender and joyful moment with the Virgin, which is completely different from what we've seen in that kind of very strict pose of earlier. This is really the turning point for Raphael. And as you can see, this is happening during the Florentine period when he's able to observe those paintings, those pieces of work by Leonardo and Michelangelo and really push beyond what he's already learned from Perugino in that sense. So um, this, is, this is why the Venois Madonna is so important for us because A, it highlights how important and referential Leonardo and that specific piece was already at the time and also the transition of the artist himself. However, if you're paying close attention and you're looking through the window at the back, that's the exact same um, type of background that what you've seen here in many ways. So there is still continuity. There is still Raphael. He's just trying to make he, you know, make it his own way. Well, let's move on to um, the painting that I think is really his, his big moment in his youth, which is the deposition. Now, this is a beautiful painting, and if you have the ability to see it in, in real life, I promise you that the digital copy doesn't do it any justice. Now, you may know it by other names, which I have listed in there for you. And we've talked about these different names several times before, but in, in case you don't remember, sometimes when we are learning about paintings, uh, we learn from inventories. And different inventories by different people or over different moments of times have listed uh, paintings under different titles. And the reason for that is because the artists themselves are not really normally given name to their art. This is something that is either done by the patrons or by the people taking account of the paintings themselves. So that's what leads us to having sometimes many different names for the same piece of art. I appreciate it can be a bit confusing. So if, if you know this painting by the Antonment, for example, which is one of the most common ones in this day and age or by any of the others, you are not wrong. It's just, you know, even, even from the point of view of standardization in terms of art history, sometimes we cannot get rid of, you know, some of those peculiarities because it's just part of the history of the painting itself. The, the cataloging process can be quite uh, quite complicated. Well, this is another another one of those paintings that is an oil on wood, 
and this was actually supposed to be part of a of a three piece for an altar. This was the center panel, and um, the altar piece had actually been commissioned by Atalanta Bagliani of Perugia to commemorate the death of her son Grifonetto. Now. The relationship here between patron and the piece of art, I think, is very obvious. What we see here is the very moment after which Christ has been taken down from the cross. And of course, it's the moment where the, the Virgin Mary, alongside with the rest of the community, are carrying the body of Christ to the Holy Sepulchre. The idea here is that Atalanta is somehow reflecting on the fact that just like the Virgin Mary, she has lost her dear son. And the way Grifonetto dies is actually quite brutal. And that's what relates to the point that I've put there at the bottom, the Condottiere Wars. Well, um, this requires a little bit of explanation for the sake of context. Now, uh, a Condottiero uh, is um, a mercenary, a soldier, but unlike most mercenary sort of bands in Europe, condottiere uh, tended to be related to specific noble families or lineages in, in Italy. You know, remember that every single big uh, sort of city state in Italy was almost its own thing. They were run by different, often competing factions. And they may not have had standing armies, but having a cousin or a, a distant relative who had their own mercenary band and they could call upon was actually very handy. So the Condottiere Wars are going to be quite crucial for the development of Italy in the late Quattrocento, in the late 1400s, and the early Cinquecento. And we will talk a bit more about this next week. So unfortunately, there was a, a huge loss of life from young men fighting these wars, whether it was directly as a result of the war or in small family feuds between different factions. So this is reflecting on a contemporary event through, once again, the eyes of liturgy. And what is really remarkable about this painting is that I think you can see the shift in color control here from the two previous Madonnas, but in composition. In fact, this long line that you see here from the top of the gentleman that has the yellow turban to the uh, bottom of the feet of Christ, that diagonal is something that most of you that have done my talk on, on Caravaggio or Rembrandt already know. This is something that we're going to see a lot in the Baroque. So here is Raphael bringing uh, a 3D element by creating perspective with that diagonal that is going to be something that masters 100 years later are going to copy and utilize to create a whole new movement. So he wasn't just learning and borrowing from Leonardo and Michelangelo. He was trying to change things. The difference is, you know, he dies too young. He couldn't change everything in one go, guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we cannot have too many expectations. And yet, look at the advance that he has in just a couple of years. It's remarkable. Well, let's talk about perhaps one of the most important pieces of art because of its location that Raphael ever did. The painting that you're seeing now, which is a fresco, and the next one on the following slide are related. They are in the same room, in the Stanza della Segnatura in the Vatican. Well, this fresco is one of the four that Raphael creates for this uh, room specifically under the commission for the Vatican. And in here, what they're trying to reproduce is um, an understanding of the world of knowledge and reason. And as such, uh, Raphael decided that the best way to portray this is by talking about philosophy. You know, the Renaissance is going to be a moment in time where humanism is going to be embraced by everybody. And therefore, we're going to be seeing a, a, a comeback of Greco-Roman traditions. One of the greatest gifts that Greek and Roman, um, you know, uh, societies give us is their uh, knowledge and, and the, re the record of that knowledge. So uh, as new ideas come through, the going back to the classics is going to be super important for Italian society overall. And that's uh, no different here in this um, in this painting. Now, the, the motive is all surrounding the two figures in the middle, who are Aristotle and Plato, who are considered the two most influential uh, philosophers in the Renaissance. And in fact, they had already been through the Middle Ages. 
And what is very interesting is how Raphael uses here the um, architectural features of the fresco to give us once again dimension. It's something that, for example, other artists are better known for doing, like Botticelli, which you may have remembered from the lecture we did in World Virtual Tours a few months ago. But um, it's all about symmetry in here. So it's not just the fact that we have Aristotle and, and Plato in the middle. Everyone else in this room are supposed to be representations of important philosophers, whether they are contemporary or from uh, Greco-Roman times. Now, there is a cheeky moment in here, uh, which relates us back to something we had already spoken about last week with Michelangelo. There is a moment in this painting when Raphael actually reworks the whole scene, or at least a big chunk of the whole scene, because this is roughly the same moment in time towards the end um, when Michelangelo is finishing the beautiful ceiling for the Sistine Chapel. So Raphael goes, sees what Michelangelo is doing, and he goes like, whoa, hang on a moment, let's do that. Now, Michelangelo apparently took this as serious offense, because he thought that kind of showed that, that Raphael was not himself an innovative, creative person. He was just like copy pasting what someone else had done. Now, you know, we can discuss semantics as much as you want from that perspective. Is it copying? Is it admiring the fact that someone you consider to be your better has done something so remarkable and you decide you need to, to step it up? Is it the fact that Raphael was very aware that a lot of the rooms in the Vatican didn't necessarily have a lot of cohesion, so he tries to approach cohesion from that perspective? Is this a, a homage to Michelangelo, which he brushes off as uncreative copying? How much of that is Raphael's fault? How much of that is Michelangelo's ego? You know, I'll leave that to you guys. But this was actually quite controversial. And it, it seems that this is the moment when they both start, you know, butting heads. So there was, I don't know if necessarily a rivalry, but definitely um, an awareness of each other that wasn't necessarily cool. Let's just say that. But, you know, whichever the case, the, the way in which Raphael uses space here to create this dynamic presentation of the Academy is, um, is beautiful and what makes this painting so remarkable. Well, on the same room, we also have this, Raphael's Parnassus. Um, and as you can see, done at the same time because these were done simultaneously, also a fresco. Now, what we see here is slightly different, but it follows a, a similar idea. What you have portrayed here is uh, a depiction of the god Apollo as the god of the arts. That's why you see him with the um, with the bowed guitar, which is, is not. It's a specific Greek instrument, but we will not talk about that today. And the people that surround Apollo are the nine muses. Now, the fact that the muses are nine is very important for this fresco because, as you may remember, in Renaissance, everything is about symmetry and harmony. So since the muses are nine, and you cannot really make that up, you know, this is pretty clear in Greek mythology how many we have, Raphael had to make sure everything else went according to the number of muses. So what he decides to do is put the muses there in the middle with Apollo, and then he also chooses nine Roman poets and nine contemporary humanists, so nine, nine, and nine, which is also a very nice triangle and, and a perfect number, that can all be divided by three, which is a very important number in religious sort of liturgy and overall in, in the mathematics of the Renaissance. And as such, that is how we achieve this harmonious painting without it being disheveled, which is important. Um, because otherwise, you know, if you would have picked like one Roman poet and five contemporary <laughs> um, uh, humanists, yes, you still have six and six and nine are multiples of three, blah, blah, blah but it will not look harmonious. And that's very important in here. Now, while you may understand why he chose uh, philosophy to represent knowledge and the height of humanism in the previous room, you may be wondering why the topic here is poetry or, or this specific form of art, right? Well, um, we know that in these paintings, Raphael had a tiny bit of artistic license because essentially, 
they kind of just told him, okay, we need five, uh, sorry, four paintings in this room that represent human knowledge of different kinds. Kind of up to you how you promote this vision. There were some suggestions, but not necessarily everything set in stone. Now, remember what Raphael's father was, a painter and a poet. In Raphael's mind, poetry was the epitome of literature, and I mean, Poetry in Italy at the time is considered, you know, a very important art. So he decides to use Parnassus as his uh, apogee representation of human knowledge from an artistic point of view. That's why it is philosophy and poetry. One more along the lines of Renaissance, one from a more personal perspective. And it's little things like that that give us insight into his mind. Because the older that Raphael gets, the farther out of the cookie cutter kind of shape painter that he makes himself be, he will start deviating from. And it's unfortunate that his life will be cut so short. Um, because I think we would have seen a very different, uh, you know, kind of uh, person and artist if he got to the age of Leonardo or, or Michelangelo. Well, here we start seeing what Raphael does best in his own terms. This is another beautiful fresco, which again, a lot of people don't see. So if you have the ability to go to Rome and you can go to Villa Farnesina, please do look at this because again, the, the digital painting doesn't do it any justice. This is um, a fresco that depicts the Nereid Galatea. Now, in case you're not familiar with um, Greek myth, let me explain what a Nereid is. It, Nereids are essentially one of the many different types of nymphs that we have in Greek mythology, and Nereids are usually nymphs or sprites associated with bodies of water. Sometimes the ocean, sometimes rivers, but normally big bodies of water. And Galatea is a quite prominent um, character because she features in the metamorphosis of uh, Ovid. Now, we are pretty sure that uh, Raphael uses that a written representation of Galatea for inspiration of this painting, given the specific moment that he picks of her in the in the chariot with the dolphins. But if you remember anything from that lecture we had about Botticelli a few months back, or if you know Botticelli yourself, this may be hinting at a few other things, no? <laughs> I'm sure you may be noticing in here the very clear uh, references to the birth of Venus. Now, this goes to show that Raphael didn't just have that knowledge from Leonardo or Michelangelo. He was very well versed. Um, one of the, I guess, advantages of coming a little bit into, late into the game is that you can really learn from all of those beautiful minds that have come before you. And a very clear, clear sign of that impact is the very shell in which you see a Galatea that she uses as, as chariot on the uh, on the actual um, uh, dolphins and whatnot. But what makes this painting really stand out is the, the color mastery. Now you see all of the bodies are depicted beautifully and very clearly and crisp because the color blending here is impeccable. And for a fresco to have this degree of good color blending, that's hard. You know, you're, you're painting literally on a damp surface with pigment. Getting that degree of smoothness is complicated. It's not like in oil or other things where you could potentially touch over. You gotta be really precise. And it's that mastery, the reason why you can see that the same color palette is used for the sky and the sea. And yet we go from a very deep blue to a very perfect horizontal view of where the sky begins and the water ends. And that's all through color blending and the, the techniques that he will learn specifically from Leonardo in this case. And it's something we, we think that, you know, perhaps inspiration from pieces like The Last Supper, maybe, but not entirely, not entirely clear on that one, but definitely, definitely something to consider. Well, we're going to be moving now to a, a different thing that Raphael did for us. And uh, since we are approaching the sort of halfway through point of the tour, I will also put in there uh, the links to remind you of the upcoming tours and, uh, of course, uh, the links in there so you can donate to keep World Virtual Tours going through PayPal and Stripe. 
And what, as you can see, this is neither a painting or a fresco. This is something very different and something a lot of people tend to forget about. This is um, Tiki Chapel. There you go. That, that was, <laughs> I was waiting for the, <laughs> for the pop-up to appear. Well, this is one of the very few projects that we have of Rafael as an architect that we still uh, have. Many of them, unfortunately, are lost. And Chiqui Chapel goes to show the huge amount of uh, support that Rafael manages to achieve in a short period of time in Rome. Now, the inspiration for this, unsurprisingly, comes from St. Peter's Basilica and from the Pantheon. Now, remember that St. Peter's Basilica was in the process of being finished by Michelangelo at, at the time, um, but the Pantheon was already standing. So that's uh, kind of the, the mix that he gets from them. And the most important thing here, really, and, and where his contribution really comes to shine as an artist, is on the dome. Everything that you see there, that beautiful mosaic, which actually represents um, the creation of the world, mixing a bit of pagan and a little bit of Christian mythology together, that is where he really excels in this project. Now, what is interesting about um, this is that Raphael actually didn't finish the project overall. Um, the whole chapel remains uh, with a few uh, a few things to be completed, and that will be done by later artists because unfortunately he dies um, before before he can get it finished. Uh, but just so you can get an idea of the kind of people who were funding Raphael and his development as an artist at this moment in time, Agostino Chigi, hence the name the Chigi Chapel, was one of the wealthiest bankers in Rome at the time. We're talking of serious money. So how well connected was this kid? Because he was just into his 20s. You know, he's, he's not that old at all when doing this. That's why I thought Chigi Chapel was a good thing to bring here, just to give you, you know, the other side of his story. All of the artists that we've seen in in this course are not just one thing. They may be famous for a specific thing, like Michelangelo the Scultore, even though then he went to do all, all other kinds of things, or Leonardo as an artist, but also an inventor. This is what being a man of the Renaissance means. You devolve different things. You have to be constantly learning new things and embracing the world around you to be able to improve your craft because from building, you learn how to paint better in the same way that you learn how to create better shape of the human body from doing sculpture. So there is a lot of overlap in there. And the reason why these three are really considered masters is not just because they're very good at one thing. It's because they're actually able to push into different aspects of other arts. Well, speaking about pushing, and getting to the uh, bottom of his career, we're going to start looking at some of the weird experiments, or weird experiments, that Raphael actually does. Um, and this is one of the two oil on canvases that he creates during his lifetime. Everything else we've seen before, fresco or an oil on wood. And now oil on canvas. Interesting stuff. Well, as you can see, a very different Madonna from what we saw at the beginning, right? Um, and not just different Madonna, but... Everything about this painting is just top-notch beautiful. This is such an iconic Raphael moment that even the little angels, the cherubs or the putty at the bottom are iconic on their own. Those cherubs have been in as many covers of books of art history as the, as the Venus, uh, as the birth of Venus, because that's the degree of detail and mastery that Raphael is getting to. And something that really unsettles a lot of people, and if you've noticed this, don't worry, it's not you going crazy. In the background, if you're paying very close attention behind the figure of the Virgin and, um, and, and everything else, can you see like little faces? Yeah, if you can, it's not because you are imagining it. They are there and it's supposed to add to the ethereal and sort of mystical feeling of this painting. Well. This is the, the Sistine Madonna, as we've come to know her in, um, in art history. And it's one of the last Madonnas that he will do. Um, and you can see here, we don't just have a change in 
tradition. Like it's no longer a Madonna sitting with the child. We see a completely different color palette. The blending is a lot smoother and the composition is richer. Well, the reason for that is because um, this Madonna is actually an interpretation um, of the Madonna as an apparition. That's the reason why the guy that you see there is uh, actually Saint Jerome, I believe. I could be wrong. I'm now confusing my saints, but I think it's Saint Jerome or Saint Sebastian. No, not Saint Sebastian. Saint Sebastian is normally nailed to the cross. Anyway, um, the the apparition here is supposed to um, ensure that we are um, participant of um, what it's happening here. And it's not Saint Jerome, by the way. I got it all wrong. It's Saint Sistus is the, the yellow mantle. It's Saint Sistus. I was thinking of Leonardo and, and Saint Jerome in the desert. <laughs> My bad. So this is Saint Sistus, who is just becoming a saint right now. And the Virgin is appearing to him for this purpose. The woman on the other side is Santa Barbara, who normally has a, a mystical sort of um, a sense of her own right. And the Virgin and the, the child look a little bit scared or maybe put off looking straight at us. That is to make us complicit of the apparition itself. We are witnesses to this. And this is one of the many, many mystical paintings that Raphael is going to do now for the rest of his career, which are actually very different from what he was doing before. Why is that? We're not entirely sure, because unfortunately for us, this man is going to die shortly, in the next six years. And perhaps he didn't have enough time to develop those ideas further. But that's the reason why this is so different from what you've seen before. The maturity of him as both as a human being and as an artist is really far gone in, in 10 years. Look how much he's changed. Well, speaking of oils on canvas, here is another oil on canvas where we're going to see a lot of transformation in his character and in his design of things. This is not a commission per se. We are almost sure this was meant to as a gift for his friend, who is the man that you see represented here, Baldassare Castiglione. Well, um, Baldassare Castiglione was uh, an Italian courtier and author and very good friend of Raphael. And at the moment when this painting is done, Castiglione had just uh, released a book on essentially the manners and way that an Italian courtier should conduct themselves in court and in the world overall. One of the things that his friend Castiglione puts a lot of emphasis on is in looks, aesthetics and presentation. Because, well, this was an important aspect of, you know, high society at the time. So there are two theories. Either he did this for his friend as a gift to celebrate the book and his you know, good fortune, or potentially for the reason of the fact that he was, a, a, as a courtier, he traveled quite a lot. So maybe it was for his family to keep when he was not around, uh, or to kind of highlight those very ideas that Castiglione had put on paper. So there would be a visual reference, if you see what I mean. Well. Everything about this painting is very not Raphael, and yet this is going to become one of the most important uh, portraits uh, for a male figure in history. Every single um, late Renaissance and, more importantly, Baroque artist will be using this as referent period. And I'm talking of Tiziano, I'm talking of Rubens, I'm talking of Rembrandt. This becomes the standard. If you want to be good at doing portraits, you need to study this and you need to do exactly this. And in many ways, um, it's something that was already in the making. Um, the, if you think about the Mona Lisa, for example, how the hands are holding and the posture, they are not that dissimilar. But of course, the Mona Lisa is female painting, which is a different story. There, there are different standards, believe it or not, as to how we treat female beauty and the female body and fashion, and the same for men. So this is where the standard is specifically raised for male portraits. Well, 
What's important about here? The color palette that you see is very dark, right? Look at all of these blacks and different shades of browns. That's not very Raphael. Why is that? Well, if he was indeed trying to be faithful to the image of his friend or the you know values that his friend is promoting in the book, he would have to use that aesthetic. So this is different because Raphael is being very faithful to the reality of what he's drawing in that regard. The other thing to consider in here is that, well, the fact that this is a canvas, the fact that this is an oil on canvas, that it's not a specific commission that, you know, there are so many things that take it out of the traditional work that Raphael was doing. Perhaps the reason why we don't see also his traditional colors is because he's not constrained by the potential vision of a patron, right? This is something that's coming straight from his own personal dialogue. So maybe by having that gift or, or personal touch added to it, he's actually freeing himself and revealing his true mastery. Because I can guarantee you blending black and brown together and making them look like different shades and having texture, because that hat has texture. I'm sure you can see all the bits that fall. It's very hard. Doing it with contrasting colors like blue, <clears throat> sorry, or maybe red is a lot easier. But this is a, a different story altogether. Well, now that we've started to see how Raphael is transgressing, let's have a look at what we consider to be his best work. These are the Raphael cartoons. And if you're lucky enough to live in the UK, you can see them for free in the Victorian Albert Museum. Now, why are they called cartoons? Well, what you're seeing here are not paintings. These are full-size drawings uh, for tapestries. The tapestries uh, exist still to date. They're actually in the Vatican, not in the original chamber where they were supposed to be, in the Sistine Chapel. They're part of the Vatican's tapestry uh, collection. But these were full-size drawings for the tapestries that were to be made um, as, as a result of this. Now, I've only put four of them in here because they are seven in total. And, well, I, I would need far too much space and you wouldn't be able to see in detail how wonderful these pieces of art are. Because here is where we agree collectively as art historians that Raphael surpasses himself. And you're probably wondering, why is that? Well, in a similar situation than Michelangelo with the um, with St. Peter's Chapel, this was a commission that had him in exclusivity. Unlike Chigi Chapel that remains, or, or at the time he dies, remains unfinished because he was juggling other pieces of work. For this, they just wanted him on it. The Pope decided, no, we need to get these tapestries done right. And I want your full attention into this. And we think the fact that he had the ability to focus so much in these seven cartoons is what allows him to get to this standard. Now, what is also remarkable is the fact that I'm sure that if you're looking into them, you realize in terms of you know, detail or maybe decoration, they're a bit more simple. But the simplicity is actually what really makes them stand out because in simplicity, there is still an insane amount of detail. Now, what you're seeing here, the, the, the composition of, of these bits overall um, are just depictions taken from the gospels and from the acts of the apostles. So that's, that's what you see. Now, what also shows how good Raphael is as an artist in this particular pieces is the fact that they are huge, because you know, as a tapestry, we're talking of several meters uh, of, of length. Um, but of the fact that, um, I don't know if you know how tapestries are made, but they are a mirror image. They are, they are reversed, essentially. So Raphael knew that whatever he designed here, it wasn't going to be like for like. It was going to be a, a reverse image. I know that may sound like it's not complicated to, to do the work that way, but you need to think twice over exactly how you want the final product to look like. And that's not, a, you know, the, the sense of spatial awareness and, and general, you know, image composition is not something everybody would have had. 
So it's remarkable that he manages to do seven of these, well, seven that we still have preserved, that they do get transmitted into tapestries. And because of the high degree of detail and, and beauty of these, they actually become super popular in the 18th and 19th century. And during the, the boom of the, of the print industry for art, this will be one of the most copied pieces in art history period. So this is what really makes us think the later years of Raphael are really the golden years, even though perhaps some of the other pieces are more iconic. Well, and speaking of golden years, let's talk about more interesting and, you know, transitions and uh, things that are a little bit out there and that surprise us about Raphael. The last two paintings are very interesting. And this is La Fornarina, or as it was previously known, a portrait of a young woman. Why is it so interesting? Well, this is one of my favorite paintings of Raphael because it's just so unlike him. I mean, look at this. We have a partial nude. When have you seen Raphael doing that? We actually have accounts of Raphael criticizing people like Michelangelo for certain nudes for being a bit too in your face. So this is very out of character for him. Um, as a portrait, we can see some similarities between this and the one from Baldassare Castiglione. But uh, what is uh, remarkable about this is not just the technique that you see reflected here in terms of the the blending of the the smoothness of the skin, how the smoothness of the skin still has perfect contrast with the veil that uh, the woman is using to cover her sort of abdomen, but the fact that we just don't know why he did this, the the um, identity of the woman depicted here is one of the most controversial things in Raphael's career and something that we as art historians cannot agree upon, by the way. So again, this one is entirely up to you to decide who she is, why, etc., etc. Now, the most commonly accepted theory is that this woman is um, Margarita Lutti, who was uh, the daughter of a baker in Siena. Um, and that would make sense in terms of the name La Fornarina, which quite literally comes to mean, you know, the, the baker or the baker of the or the baker's daughter in this case. And we know that uh, Rafael had one such lover in Siena for a little while. So perhaps this is her depiction. But there are other theories that suggest that this is a representation of what we call women in the margins of society. I'm talking of witches. I'm talking of prostitutes. I'm talking of women who perhaps don't convey with the normal you know, standards of society, which is why perhaps he is revealing that body. Another theory, however, is that this may just be Raphael experimenting with female beauty, just like he had just done with the portrait of uh, Baldassare Castiglione, um, to create an idealized version of feminine beauty, perhaps using that Margarita Lutti as a, a model even if it's just in his mind. Which one of them is likely to be? Well, we are not sure, but as an interesting detail and something for you guys to think about, you see the armband in there. Well, if you have very keen eyes, you will see that this actually says Raphael and his name. This is one of the very few paintings that he actually signed. So it's interesting that a woman related to him, potentially his lover has his name written on the arm, if you see what I mean, there could be something there. Well, moving on to the last painting on, on this session, because I'm appreciating that we need to open the chat for questions in a moment. This is the Transfiguration. And this is really the height of his work, which didn't finish. He actually died painting this. Um, this is a clear discussion of his inner dialogue and curiosity. So we can see he's going through religious ideas in here. And what this represents is um, actually a tradition that was very popular before Raphael and also in Eastern Orthodox tradition rather than in Roman Catholic, which is the, the moment of the transfiguration, which is that metamorphosis where the figure of Christ uh, on top of the, of the mountain becomes a properly divine being. Again, with transfiguration, transformations, Perhaps another hint into mythology from a Greek perspective, you know, we are not sure. But 
there is obviously something going on in here, perhaps some neoplatonic ideas like we've seen with Leonardo and with Michelangelo around the same time period, it would make sense. But what is incredible about this is the composition. As you can see, we have tears all using once again landscape and color and that body of Christ that is certainly levitating, but can you notice that the dimensions of that body of Christ are a little bit strange and make him pop out of the picture a bit more? That's because, well, the, the oil blending in here is so good. That white, to get white that pure to stand out, you need to be so clean with your lines and your blending overall. Uh, but more importantly, we think this may be a precursor to mannerism. Remember, mannerism is that art style that becomes popular in the later Renaissance. We've seen Michelangelo and Leonardo having influence into it as well. It's an art style that is uh, all about color saturation, these twisted compositions and everything about the human body, which is elongated and put in certain positions to exaggerate the features, but that allow it to have more dynamism. And yet, this is an incomplete painting. I know, I know you're looking at a masterpiece thinking, how can this be an incomplete painting, Lily? But we consider it incomplete because if you're looking uh, <laughs> on the bottom right corner, that patch that looks like a rock, it's not a rock. That's a, that's just the base coat that he never actually got to, to finish texture. And if you're looking down on, on the bottom edges as well, you will notice a few more elements like that. And still, with that being incompleted, like with the Mona Lisa or some of the other things we've seen, is still considered one of the best oil paintings in history. And that is pretty much the, the life of Raphael in terms of what he's able to do um, before he, he dies. Uh, now, I'm going to take us to the next slide so we can have some recommendations here about books. And I'm also going to open up the, the chat. So let me let me do that for you guys. So you're very welcome to drop in there any comments, any ideas that you may have, any thoughts. And I'm, I'm just going to have a bit more of water and I'll, um, I'll run you through this through these talks. <clears throat> Why were, um, right, so the, the tapestries themselves, they are actually in the Vatican itself. What was taken is the, the cartoons, so the, the actual paper copy of the tapestry, that's what we have in, um, in London in the, uh, in the actual v &A. So the tapestries are still in Rome because the tapestries really are the the greater example of art in, in, you know, from two perspectives, from the point of view of being a Raphael design and a beautiful, <clears throat> and a beautiful tapestry. Um, but yes, well, the, the way, the way, uh, the way different um, art pieces end up in, in different, you know, places in, in, in the world, it's all often due to curation work. It's often due to loans and just, different agreements that are worked by, you know, different uh, uh, artistic societies or, or countries just to, um, just to uh, improve, sorry, my, my voice is starting to go, to improve the way that they uh, control and curate art overall. So that's, that's kind of how it ends there. Um, particularly important museums like the British Museum or the v &A that have been gathering art for hundreds of years they they have um i guess important connections to um to how he to how they manage these things and that's how they are able to um to get onto these um big big um big uh, commissions that perhaps do not belong in there. As someone just asked, how did he die? We're not entirely sure, but he dies of a very acute illness. He's like very ill for about 15 days, something like that, a couple of weeks. And that was it. He, he's gone. There has been some ideas as to what led to it. There, we think maybe he had some kind of blood infection or a very severe virus because we have some records of some bloodletting. But um, we are not entirely sure. And this is a, a problem that we have with, unfortunately, you know, many of these artists that because at the time science is not that well 
known from that perspective, we are not always entirely sure um, how um, how it happens. And he dies at the age of 37, by the way. So he dies at the age of 37 in 1520. The cause of death, like I said, not entirely sure, but seems to be a very, very nasty illness that takes him kind of by storm and, and just takes him completely out of the picture. You know, consider that back then, even a very nasty flu could kill you. Even if you're a young person, all you needed to have was a little something in your blood system. We think sometimes some of the products that um, artists use, particularly oils, may have affected their lungs. So they were quite prone to respiratory conditions because of that. So it could be one of those things, but we're not entirely sure. So I cannot confirm that. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad. Um, that you guys have enjoyed this. Thank you so much. <laughs> very, very kind. The Madonnas you saw at the... Uh, yes, yes, 100% uh, airing. And it's it's exactly because of that, because these Madonnas are then going to influence Rubens and Tiziano, but they were created by Leonardo and then Raphael first. So it's it's interesting how we've associated that roundness of the body when with Rubens, when actually it's something that comes from an earlier period. But that's part of what makes art art. Rubens makes it a trend. These guys were just, you know, putting it out there, changing the field. So sometimes it takes more than one generation or two for things to stick. Right, I'll talk through the <laughs> through the uh, books very briefly, guys, just because otherwise I'll forget about it. Um, if you if you can get access to Marsha Hall, the, the Cambridge, um, Companion to Raphael is the best book out there. It's huge. It's pretty thick, but everything that you could potentially ever want to know about Raphael will be there. Um, Klein Blob's The Vision and the Visionary in Raphael is very good to understand those kind of mystical paintings of the artist. So if you want to get into the meta of it, definitely a good read. And the, the Life of Raphael by Vasari, any of the lives of the artist by Vasari will be good at given you a um, contemporary view of those artists. But the one I particularly like, and if you get access to it, would be very useful for the lecture next week, is Robert Williams' Raphael and the Re Redefinition of Art in Relations Italy. Because like I said, Leonardo and Michelangelo were already pushing the boundaries, but Raphael kind of makes it be, okay, everybody else needs to now be from here up and from here on. So it's very good at contextualizing what those new standards become, why and, and how, essentially, um, from that from that regard. So um, I think I have uh, about a couple of minutes more to be able to answer some more questions. So I'll put in there the details as well for the donations and the upcoming tours once again, and that will actually allow me to scroll back into a into this. The um Sandra, you can still catch Michelangelo's um Michelangelo's one on, on the World Virtual Tours Academy and on YouTube, but do it fast because um like I said, these are on a on a short period available. I'm glad that you love uh, Baldassare Castiglione's portrait. I think it's one of the best uh, Elizabeth. Um I have a confession to make. Um, <laughs> Please don't hate me for this, but Raphael is my least favorite artist of the great masters. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know I've beaten him up a lot, but I, I, I couldn't care less. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible. I mean, from a personal perspective, I, of course, appreciate his his art. But from a personal perspective, I, I really don't connect with him as much as with the others. And yet I think that portrait of Baldassare Castiglione is just something else, top notch for sure. What were the, well, the tapestries were actually woven earrings. So this, these were literally done by a by a big loom machine. So the, the tapestries are all literally uh, textile. There is no paint in there. So that's the reason why the color had to be extra important because otherwise, um, you know, with thread is very difficult to obtain the same clarity, which is why he had to work extra hard to get those top notch in terms of, of blending. And you have the carrots in the kitchen. That's so cute, Eric, I, I love that. And yes, I will be resting my voice. I have a kettle over here. I'm gonna be making myself some some tea so I can uh, 
keep it keep it uh, fresh for a couple of days because well we have we have more talks coming up shortly so <laughs> I need to be in in full in full blast um, but wow thank you so much guys you're very very kind I'm, I'm glad that you see the importance of these of these pieces and I'm glad that you're seeing how they've influenced the, the Dutch masters poly as well um, so you know you forgive me thank you thank you thank you so much. <laughs> It's I know it's a it's a big statement to make when I've been trying to convince you. Hey, this is uh, worth studying, guys. <laughs> and then we come in and say, by the way, it's not my cup of tea. But it's it's something that is very important when it comes to history and art. Just because you don't like something, it doesn't mean it's not worth learning about it. And I would not be able to appreciate Rembrandt, who is my favorite artist, as good as I do if I didn't know Raphael because I, I wouldn't have that point of reference, if you see what I mean. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is um, <laughs> don't let, don't always let your personal taste get in the way of, of your ability to learn and appreciate the world around you. Because then you can come across with a lot of knowledge and still hate it, no matter what. <laughs> but anyway, I think that's all we have um, time for today, guys, because there is a, a, another uh, talk in about half an hour. So if you're around in World Virtual Tours in about half an hour, there is another another talk. So uh, go check them out. You have once again the links in there. Thank you so much for all your support and for being so kind in terms of uh, supporting the the um, free academy. And uh, if, if you're around, I hope to see you in, in Malta live um, this Saturday at 4 p.m. CET. And well, I will uh, let you get on with the rest of your day now, guys. Take care, and I'll see you very soon.